Help me praise Him. God's been good to you. Hallelujah. I tell you, if you can't praise Him this morning, you don't know Him. God's been good to me. I'm alive. I am saved. I am blessed. I am kept by the power of God. Hallelujah. How excellent is your name in all the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our God and Father, I thank you today for the kindness and mercy you've shown to me. I realize now that if it had not been for the Lord in my life, the enemy would have swept me away. But here I stand, founded on a solid rock, even Jesus. Thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for keeping me from destroying myself and my foolishness and sins. Thank you for letting me hear the gospel. Thank you, oh God, for that altar I nailed in. Thank you, oh God, for those people that prayed around me. Thank you, God, for all the people that prayed for me to bring me to salvation. We all have that testimony today, Lord. Somebody prayed for us. Somebody's prayers were heard on our behalf. And here we stand to say, how excellent is your name in all the earth. So I ask it again and I ask it in front of them, Lord, because I want them to know that I don't have this down. I don't know how to do this. This has to be you through me. All you asked me to do today was let you speak through me. I do that. I've given myself to you, Lord. Touch this tongue with a cold from heaven's altar. I ask you today to give us hearing ears and seeing eyes. Give us a heart that understands. Don't let one person leave here today unsure of his or her salvation. Let everyone watching on that screen sense the presence of God. Some of them are not dressed. They're, some of them are eating while they're doing it. But I'm asking you to let them sense holiness and reverence that they're not in just their house. They're in the presence of a, a risen Savior and an all-powerful God. Put your coffee cup down and put your bun down. You're in the presence of the Lord. Gather your children around and realize this is a holy place. You're standing on holy ground as I am right now. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Today I'm going to ask you to join me in three verses. I'm going to preach about one man. His name is Enoch. Enoch represents the rapture of the church. I pray that you're ready to go if that moment happens while I'm preaching. In Genesis chapter 5, beginning with verse 21. There we are. Begin reading with me, please. Enoch lived 65 years and he begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Hmm. Isn't that an amazing passage of Scripture? And he was not, for God took him. Thank you for being seated. This is almost a thousand years before the flood. 
Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. That was his son. The next word grabs you. After. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. Now, what happened that when that baby was born, Enoch's life changed until he died? He walked with God till he died. What was it about this baby? I'll tell you. <clears throat> the name Methuselah means when he is gone, it will come. God had a conversation with Enoch and said, the world is going to get worse and worse and I'm going to give it time to repent and then I'm going to destroy it with a flood. When your son Methuselah dies, it will come. When this baby boy of yours breathes his last breath, destruction will come on this world. And that's what happened when Methuselah was born and God revealed this great truth to Enoch. After that, he walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. After that, every day of his life, he woke up saying, could this be the day? He did not know that Methuselah was going to live 969 years. In fact, Methuselah, I'm sorry, Enoch only lived 300 more years. So Enoch would get up when the boy was six years old and say, I wonder. If he dies, the end is today. And then the boy was 18. And sometimes the boy would come home late and his father would think, oh my, could this be the day? Is he gone? Is he dead? Is the end here? 25, 40, 50 years of age, 75 years of age, 100 years of age. It hasn't happened yet because Methuselah is still alive. It cannot happen as long as Methuselah is breathing. And Enoch awakened himself every day. He lived a normal life. He had sons and daughters. He got up and he took care of his family and his business. But every day when he opened his eyes and breathed his breath, he wondered, is my boy alive in there? Because if he isn't, this is the last day on this earth. Destruction is coming. And what you have, friend, is a picture of the rapture of the church. God cannot send destruction to this world until the church is gone. We've already suffered the wrath of God at the foot of the cross. We are the body of Christ. As the body of Christ, we cannot go through the tribulation because that's the judgment and wrath of God. Jesus already suffered the judgment and wrath of God on the cross. Every day when I get up, I am supposed to think, I must think, the rapture could happen today. The catching away, the trumpet could sound, the Lord could appear in the clouds and call his church his bride, home. But you carry on, even though it hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. Because it has been a long time doesn't mean it won't happen. It just means it's closer to the time than it's ever been before. So all the days of Enoch were 365, and Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. Think about it. He walked with God. Every step he took, he had God on his mind. He wanted to please God. He wanted his life to be a praise to God. 
He remembered what God said. He stood on the word of God. He knew that God would not nullify his word. He would not renege on his word. When God speaks it, it will come to pass. If it's 2,000 years, God is not impatient. He's long-suffering. If it's 3,000 years, you can count on it. It's going to come to pass. And so Enoch walked with God every day, close, meditation, obedience, praise, taking care of his business, but realizing his life was in God and any moment could be the end of that life. And one day while he was walking with God, God said, you know what? You're closer to my house now than you are yours. Just come on in. You don't even have to die. And that's what that verse means. He was not. He was just not. He was walking one day and then he wasn't. He was here one day and then he was gone. He was raising children and even preaching the word of God to the lost generation. But one day he was just gone. I'm trying to tell the church it's going to happen just that way. We are living for God. We ought to be walking with God. We ought to be preaching for Christ. And one day, we'll just be gone. There'll be no gradual evolution. It won't just be a floating up in the air. We'll just be gone. There'll be no time for anybody to repent. You can't get your bills paid up. You can't get it right with anybody. If you've got a lie in your heart, there's no time to get it out. You got to be ready right now. You don't know the day or the hour when the Son of Man is going to call you into the clouds. You got to be honest now. You got to be praying now. You got to be truthful now. You got to be righteous now. You can't just work on it and cross your fingers and hope that when you get to be old, you'll get it fixed. You got to walk with God right now. Every day, you get up and you start all over again. This is the day the Lord has made. I'll walk in the truth. I'll tell the truth. I'll obey the truth. And I'll speak all the words of this life. My life will be a testimony to the word of God. Every day. God just took him. And then if you go over to Hebrews chapter 11, he's referred to again, Brother Enoch. And it goes like this. By faith, Enoch was taken away, just confirming what Genesis taught, so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. Now, I have an imagination that really goes wild sometimes. It's about to do that right now. I look at these words because I'm a word freak. And I want you to understand that every word in the Bible counts. There, there are no arbitrary phrases that, that are meaningless that the Holy Spirit threw in. Every punctuation mark is inspired by God. And so when it says Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found, it sounds to me like somebody was looking for him but couldn't find him. <clears throat> so in my mind, I see this man, Enoch, who gets up every day and checks to see if his son is alive. He gets up every day and remembers what the Lord had taught him. And then he begins to preach wherever he goes. If he's on a job somewhere, whatever he's doing, he preaches to people. Sometimes with free time and on the weekends, he stands on the street corner of the busiest part of whatever city. And he begins to preach. And he gets on people's nerves because he does it every day. And he will do it for 300 years. <laughs> and people will get irritated. You see, preachers just irritate people. Have you noticed that? <clears throat> Some preachers, you just wish they'd shut up. But they won't because they can't. And Enoch would not be quiet because he could not be quiet. And as he stood on the street corner, he preached the same thing every time he got up. And people would say, there's that old fool again. Hey, 
Uh, let's go down and listen to what or how he's going to say the same thing today. And there he was, day by day, week by week, month by month, week or year by year. He's getting grayer. He's bending over more. His voice, voice gets a little more hoarse. And he lacks the strength that he had. But he stands up and he says the same thing. Get right with God. Time is running out. My boy is proof that God's a merciful God, but he's also proof that God is a just God. And when my son dies, it's going to happen. What's going to happen, old man? A flood is coming. God is going to destroy the whole world. Where'd you get that, old man? God himself told me. Oh, God talks to you, right. Who is God anyway? Why should we believe that? You're an old fool. You've been saying the same thing for hundreds of years. Why should we believe you? He didn't take time to argue. He didn't think he had to go to seminary and learn how to defend his faith. He just stood there and said, I heard what he said. I believe what he said. Time is running out. You better get right. You better straighten up your life. You better tell the truth. You better be honest in business. You better stay with your wife. You better take care of your family. You better turn from your wicked ways. You better realize that violence is going to destroy you. Jesus is coming back one of these days. Of course, he didn't even know who he was. And I'm going to prove to you that he preached that in just a moment. But he preached and he prophesied and he reminded and he warned and he irritated and he aggravated them until one day God said, come on home, I'm finished with you. And so those people that were walking up and down the street saying, hey, let's go hear what the prophet has to say. Said he's not here today. Anybody seen Enoch? Anybody been around Enoch lately? No, we haven't seen him now. He's been gone he didn't show up yesterday either. He's gone. Where's he gone? You see, he couldn't be found because God took him. He was just gone. He disappeared. He was called home. That's exactly what I'm preaching to you about today. One of these days, the church of Jesus Christ, with all of us preachers and all of the prophets and all of the singers, and all of us who knelt at the foot of the old rugged cross are going to be gone. All oh, the world gets irritated because our traffic stops up the roads out here. We irritate them with our crowds. They're tired of hearing about Jesus. Every time they turn on the TV, there's some preacher telling them to get right with God. Everywhere they go, there's a church on every corner and they don't pay taxes. Why don't the churches pay taxes? And they get irritated. But listen to me, one of these days they won't have to be irritated anymore because Jesus at the time that we least expected is going to come back and stand on a cloud between heaven and earth and an angel is going to shout and another one's going to blow a trumpet and the dead in Christ are going to wake up out of the graves and rise up in the clouds and we who are alive will meet them in the air to be with the Lord forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, I feel like preaching this morning. <laughs> you know, if I don't irritate you, I'm not a real preacher. There are people in this church that wish I would just go away. I'm not going anywhere until Jesus calls me. You see, you see, if you get irritated about the truth, it's not the preacher's fault, it's yours. But, but what does it say here? By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He woke up every day. This was his testimony. And he said, I'm alive because of the goodness of God. I'm watching my boy get older and older, and I'm getting older. And older, and I know the time is nearer and nearer. And every day was begun with a recognition of his creator and his God. 
Listen to me. You shouldn't get you your feet should not hit the floor any morning of your life before your knees do. <clears throat> Every day of my life. Sandra's already gone sometimes. She goes and does her praying. And I'll look over and she's gone. I'll just slip right out of the bed, right down on my knee and say, God, before I say a word to her, I want to say some words to you. Thank you for letting me sleep all night. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for giving me a family. Thank you for my children, my grandchildren, my friends, my church. Thank you for health. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Lord, let me walk with you this entire day. Don't let me be distracted by this world. Don't let me think that I've got other things more pressing and more important to do than walk with you today. I'm telling every one of you, and I'm not backing up when I say this. If you don't begin your day on your knees, you will end up walking in the paths of unrighteousness at some point. Every day has to be begun at the feet of Jesus, crying out for His holiness in your life, repenting of any sins, and walking in obedience and truth. And that was Enoch's testimony that he pleased God. Folks, understand, God is honored when you read his word and obey it, when you believe it. God was honored with Enoch because Enoch only had one conversation with God, but God told him what was going to happen, and Enoch said, then that's the way it is, and this is how I'm going to live from now on. I'm going to walk with God. If I'm the only one, I'm going to walk with God. If my wife thinks I've lost my mind, I'm going to walk with God. If my workers, co-workers, think that I've become a fanatic, I'm going to walk with God. Here's how I feel about it. There's not a person, there's not a thing that's worth missing heaven over. There's not a drug, there's not a drink, there's not a person, there's not a sin, there's not a pleasure worth missing heaven over. I'm asking some of y'all who've got to have your dope every day, is dope worth missing heaven over? Some of you got to have a drink all the time. Is a drink worth missing heaven over? Some of you found your new love. You've never been in love like this before. You've never felt anything like this before. Does that feeling take the place of God's goodness in your life? Is it worth missing heaven over? Then we find one more passage in the book of Jude, one chapter, verses 14 and 15. And it goes like this. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Remember just a moment ago I told you every phrase is important in the Bible? The Holy Ghost doesn't just write nuggets of truth and then throw in Verbs and adjectives and prepositions. and No, every word matters. Now, Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Meaning, seven generations after Adam fell, God notified a man that he wasn't going to put up with it forever. And spoke to Enoch about what was coming. And it says, Enoch prophesied about these men also. What men? Well, if you go back a few verses, you see that Jude is warning the believers of false Christs, false prophets, false apostles, a false gospel, false churches. And just as... Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Or, as it was in the days before Noah, which was the days of Enoch, it will be the same way when the Lord comes back. And we are warned here about uh, 
preachers who call themselves to the ministry, who preach a different gospel, another gospel. They don't emphasize the precious blood of Jesus. They are afraid to preach on the cross. They will never bring up the wrath and judgment of God because it scares people. Because people don't want to hear that. They might not come back to church and a false prophet and a false apostle and a false Christ preaching a false gospel is that man or woman that stands in the pulpit and makes people feel better even when they are in their sins. And false teachers and false prophets and false Christs will go around behind the real prophets and preachers and say, you don't have to believe all that stuff. It's old-fashioned. It's outdated. They've lost their minds. They're just a bunch of fundamentalists. They're kind of dangerous, too. And the more they get into their religion, the more dangerous they become. And here's what happened. In Enoch's day, that precious old man of God could stand up and preach, and there were always people in the background saying, you know, you don't have to believe that. This man has lost his mind. He is a lunatic. Who in the world is this God he's talking about? You don't have to believe that. Trouble isn't coming. Judgment isn't coming. If there is a God, he's a good God. And there's nothing wrong with us. What's wrong with us that God would want to destroy us? We do our best. We pay our taxes. Or we bring up our children. We send them to Christian schools. Um, we, we, try to be, we, try to be, we try to be honest in business until it comes down to whether or not I make the deal. Then I'll stretch the truth a little bit. But God overlooks all of that stuff. We're really good people. Don't get all upset about this Enoch guy. He's lost his mind. God's a good God. And that's exactly what's being preached Today, And so Enoch prophesied about these men also saying, now what is it that Enoch preached? Can I have five more minutes with you? What is it that old brother Enoch preached? You won't believe it. I'll have to explain it to you. Enoch preached, behold the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints. This is before the flood. This is before the birth of Jesus. This is before there was a church, before any Bibles, before anything. And old man Enoch stands up and says, the Lord's coming. And he's coming back with 10,000s of his saints. He was saying thousands of years before it happened, there will be a day when God will come to this earth with 10,000s of his saints. They knew not what he was speaking of. He didn't even understand it, my brother. He didn't know anything about the fact that God would send a flood, uh, that he would call a nation and name them Israel, that he would give law and direction through the nation, that through that nation, God's son would become a human being and be born to this earth and be nailed to a cross and be put in a tomb and be raised on the third day and ascend back to heaven and for 2,000 years gather him a church, a bride, gather him a group of people who like Enoch walk with God every day. Enoch didn't understand all of that. You see, sometimes we preachers don't really understand everything we're preaching, but it's in the Bible and it's gotta be preached. I can't explain God, I can just proclaim God. I can't make you figure out everything. I haven't figured out everything, but I believe what he said, and I believe Jesus is coming back again, and it makes me want to walk with God. Can somebody else say amen here? Oh, hallelujah. All right, watch this. Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints. To do what, Enoch? to execute judgment on all. Oh. You see, even back then, uh, a Joel Osteen, he was not. <laughs> Do not get me started. <laughs> he said, the Lord is coming back and he's going to bring 
judgment to all. His wrath is going to be poured out. Now you know why I'm smiling? Because I won't be there. I've already had it dealt with. I've already faced the judge. He took my sins, my transgressions, my unrighteousness in his body. Before I was even born, he took the sins of the whole world into his body. And now whoever calls on the name of the Lord and believes that he is the sin bearer and the redeemer can have all of the wrath of God averted from them. They'll never face the judgment of God. We'll stand before him and have him say, welcome, enter into the city, enter into the kingdom. Oh, now he's going to check me out for how I live down here. I got to stand before the great <clears throat> judge and he's going to evaluate my life. And if I did things that were pleasing, they will survive but if I did things for myself, they'll be burned up. And then he'll say, come on in. And I'll find out my assignment, how I'll rule and reign with him during the millennial reign of Christ. I'm not worried about that wrath, that judgment. Did you hear me? I feel like jumping up and down, but since some of you aren't used to Pentecostal worship, I will refrain from it because I don't want to scare you. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I could jump straight up in the air right now about six feet. To believe, to know that I will never, never see the flames of hell. I will never hear him say, depart from me, I don't know you. I will never hear the screams of torment in eternal banishment. No, sir. The next thing I expect to hear is a sound like a trumpet from heaven and a voice say, come up here. Glory to God forevermore. Oh, you do better than that. You ought to praise him. Hallelujah. You, can I have five more minutes? Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his saints to execute judgment on all. Wait, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Is anybody else intrigued that the Holy Spirit in one verse used one word four times? ungodly does that make you go whoa he repeated that word four times ungodly is mentioned so being the mm, the student of the scriptures that I am I, could, I just couldn't pass it up and I pulled out all of my Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek and this that and the other and I found the word ungodly I was stunned because ungodly there does not mean uh, vile disgusting adulterous, scandalous grossly wicked none of that it means you're just too busy if you're not walking with God you're away from God if you're not walking with God, you're ungodly. If every day is not dedicated to God and His glory, I'm ungodly. Which means that I can be moral. Some of you are very moral. Uh, you can be ethical, refined. Boy, we have some refined people in this church and some educated people. You can be a law-abiding citizen. You can be honest. You can even be religious and be ungodly. You can come here every Sunday or sit in that group every Sunday and be ungodly. 
We got lots of people who think that because they go to church, they are godly. We got a little a, 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 a smattering of people that come to Central. I don't know if they'll be back, but they used to come who will go to other churches and then they say they sneak over here. But they go to downtown churches or uptown churches where all of their uh, influential co-workers where they can keep a name in the community and they'll sneak over here. And I've said many times, you don't have to sneak. Just be man enough to walk in. Be man enough to tell your friends, I went over to that spirit-filled church. You don't have to be ashamed. But you see, you can have that mindset and be ungodly. Because godly means walking with God. Ungodly means I'm, I'm not that interested. I mean, I got stuff to do. I got a business to run. People depend on me. If I'm out of work, uh, my coworkers don't know what to do. Uh, if, if I lose the business or sell the business, what happens to them? Oh, it's on me. I got to raise children. I got to take... Uh, uh, l- little Sally to ballet rehearsal. I got to take little Johnny to soccer rehearsal. I got a husband to feed. I got a wife to take care of. I can't do all that that you're saying, preacher. What you're saying is this word is not true because Jesus Christ said if you seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness all these other things will be added unto you. Did he say that? Then who are we to say, I can't do all that. Enoch certainly found time to do it. Jesus found time to do it. Our brothers and sisters in the book of Acts found time to do it. Oh, but it's this last day crowd that seems to have the most problem and the most excuses about walking with God every day. Now I'm going to close with something. Because I keep hearing these hotshot preachers on TV talk about this great world, worldwide revival that's coming. Oh, they're going to be saved by the millions. In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. What does that mean all flesh is going to be saved? I think the indicators say not. I don't believe in a last day revival. The Bible I'm preaching out of says there will be a great falling away. The Bible I'm preaching says not only will sinners not be saved, but those in the church will deny the faith and depart from the truth. I'm not looking for a worldwide revival. I'm looking for a churchwide revival right here. I'm looking for a Loran Livingston revival. I want fire to be poured on me. I want fire to burn inside of me. I want to walk with God. Here's the deal. The church, the real gospel preaching churches have always been irritating to the world, just like Enoch. But one day we'll be gone. We'll be caught up. The Lord will call us home. And then I hear other hotshot preachers say, boy, you talk about church attendance. After the rapture of the church, every church will be full. They'll kick down the doors to get into the church. No, they won't. Let me tell you why. As long as the church is here, as long as the spirit-filled church is here, darkness And the Antichrist cannot come on the scene. We're the most important people in the world. We're holding back total destruction. They're laughing at us, and we're the only thing between Almighty God's wrath and their destruction. But when the church is gone, when the Lord says, come up here, all of a sudden the restraining power of the Holy Spirit will be removed, and you talk about darkness and insanity and violence... You have no idea because a spirit of delusion will come into the world. Oh, people won't be lining up to get into the church. They'll just be glad the church is gone. 
and they'll get deeper in their sins. Let him who is unholy be unholy still. The Bible says that him that is filthy be unfilthy still. Revelation says. I talked to a pastor from uh, Brooklyn this week twice. He said, Loran, this place has gone nuts. He said, uh, the governor, I mean the mayor, has pushed the city back to phase one and said that if we get to have church at all, the earliest will be Easter of 2021. And if we have any music in the church, we have to be 12 feet apart. Then he said, the murder rate is up 112%. And if you dial 911, you don't get an answer. People are scared to death. Listen to me. You who think this is a joke, you who are not taking this seriously, listen to me. All this is taking place while the church is still here. But when the church is gone, there will be no restraint. Men will lose their minds. They won't fill up churches. They'll begin to curse and rant against Almighty God and the wrath of God will be poured out. But praise the Lord. He hung on an old rugged cross. Praise the Lord. He shed his blood. Praise the Lord. Whosoever believes in that cross will live forever. Praise the Lord. He walked out of the tomb on the third day. Praise the Lord. He's coming back for a church that's ready for him. Shout amen, somebody. Hallelujah. I'm going to close. Seems like every week I preach longer and longer. I don't care. Because it could be my last message today. If there's anybody in here and you are not sure that you are ready to meet Jesus, if it happens, and see... It'll be in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. One thirty-second thousandth of a second. Gone. If you're not sure, you can come to this altar and somebody will help you pray through as you confess your sins. I want to be honest with you. I would not leave this building until my heart screams, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I'm going to pray. And now, Jesus, with all that I had in me, I gave it. And now, Jesus, all that you are has been presented. I pray now, Lord, that your Holy, Holy Spirit will convict and cause somebody to kneel before you and then get up and walk with you the rest of their lives. And I ask it in the name of Jesus. I'd still like to hear the church shout hallelujah one time. Hallelujah. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer, Amen. Amen. See you tomorrow night at 7 for prayer meeting. The Lord be with you.